Hello everybody, welcome to this video. It's a continuation in the series on Julius Caesar. Everything I go through in this video comes from Mr. Bruff's Guide to Julius Caesar, which I co-wrote with Kerry Lewis. It's available in paperback now on Amazon, so do pick up a copy. Today we're looking at Act 2, Scene 1, and it's important to think about the setting of this scene because it's still night time, which is appropriate for a conspiracy with masked plotters. At the beginning of the scene, Shakespeare draws attention to the darkness, which serves as pathetic fallacy. Brutus has suppressed his feelings of friendship towards Caesar and has decided to join the conspiracy to murder him. The busy Lucius whose name derives from lux, Latin for light, brings a candle to Brutus. The ironic contrast between Lucius, the light bringer, and Brutus, brooding in darkness and solitude, emphasises the setting and the latter's violent thoughts. The theme of ignoring private feelings for the benefit of the public good dominates this scene. Brutus's soliloquy provides the opportunity for the audience to learn his thoughts and his feelings. Um, here's the analysis on the screen. Let's see if I can zoom in a little bit. So when he starts with, it must be by his death, this is a shocking start to his soliloquy um, after the uh, indecision in Act 1, Scene 2. Uh, when he says, uh, but for the general good, he's motivated by the public good. Uh, he uses the flawed what-if reasoning to justify his decision. There's the semantic field of the snake with the adder and the sting, uh, which has connotations of evil. Um, when he says, tis a common proof, he's admitting he has no evidence to support his concerns. And on and on it goes. A very interesting soliloquy. Um, there's the metaphor of the ladder, young ambition's ladder, which is, of course, a metaphor for ambition. There's a continuation of the semantic field of the snake. And what we've got in so many of the speeches in this play is just this beautiful, deliberate manipulation of language and structure. We've already learned that Brutus is a Stoic, and this might explain why he focuses on speculative but flawed reasoning when he decides that Caesar must die. Brutus ignores his knowledge of his friend's character. Indeed, he has no evidence that Caesar's personality will ever change after he's been crowned. And Brutus's decision that Caesar must die is based on what he perceives to be the best thing for Rome. And this is the first time in the play that we explicitly hear that Caesar must die. And it is ironic that it does not come from one of the conspirators, but from the mouth of Caesar's friend. Now, we see more evidence of Brutus's sense of honour influencing his thoughts for the public good through the device of Cassius's forged letter. By referencing his ancestors who drove out King Tarquin, Brutus seems to be saying that it is his fate to save Rome. And this example uh, centuries ago compels him to act similarly now. The letter also contains references to Rome, shall Rome, etc., which appeal to Brutus's sense of public responsibility. And after he's reflected upon the contents of the letter, he exclaims, O Rome, I make thee promise, if the redress will flow, thou receives thy full petition at the hand of Brutus. The long vowel sound in O turns the declaration that he will redress into a formal, solemn moment, which is emphasised when Brutus refers to himself in the third person. The use of this moment therefore signifies Brutus's mistaken belief that his decision to kill Caesar is at the request of the Roman citizens. Aspects of Brutus's character symbolise Rome itself, illustrating how closely he aligns himself to the public good. We learn, for example, that he's been away all night and wishes he could sleep soundly. The soft sibilance in sleep soundly is a gentle sound that connotes peace. And uh, we know that Portia later says, what, is Brutus sick? And will, and will he steal out of his wholesome bed to dare the vile contagion of the night and tempt the roomy and unpurged air to add unto the, his sickness? No, my Brutus, you have some sick offence within your mind. And in this extract, we see lots of 
imagery related to illness and infections. The adjective wholesome connotes Brutus's private domestic life of security and peace, while the imagery of illness and infection provides a contrast to that. His inability to sleep is the opposite of peace. He is being infected by the words of others, and the metaphor of illness symbolises the spreading rebellion. So once Brutus joins the conspiracy, the balance of power amongst the conspirators shifts and he begins to make important decisions and overrules Cassius. For example, Brutus rejects Cassius's suggestion of recruiting Cicero, saying he will never follow anything that other men begin. He also tells Montellus, uh, sorry, Metellus to call at the house of Ligarius to recruit him. Just send him here and I will persuade him to join our party. So this ability to take control, to make decisions, to act and make uh, decisive actions symbolises another aspect of Roman society, the manoeuvring of political powers. Now that Brutus has reached a decision, we see the full extent to which he is influenced by public opinion when he assists that the assassination of Caesar is honourable. He's moved to act by the purest of motives, the retention of the Republic. The merits of that are so self-evident, he thinks that an oath is unnecessary and demeaning. He says, do not stain the even virtue of our enterprise, nor the un insuppressive metal of our spirits to think that or our cause or our performance did need an oath. Brutus does not see the need to swear an oath because he believes this insults the integrity of the conspirators. The connotations of the noun's virtue and enterprise illustrate his conviction that they are acting for the greater good. He characterises the conspirators with un, uh, insuppressive metal of our spirits, meaning indomitable resilience of our spirits, as heroes. And it's at this point that the audience perceives the irony of the situation. Brutus's beliefs in the public good determines his view of the assassination plot. Yet he has, unlike a man of virtue, rejected his previous loyalties to his friend Caesar. And then we've got the juxtaposition of stain with virtue, which connotes blood. Brutus is asking them not to stain the virtue of the scheme with unnecessary promises. However, Brutus has already stained his own virtue, as he will betray Caesar, whose blood will be on his hands. And blood imagery is the final thing I want to talk about uh, in this scene. Blood imagery begins to dominate the play at this moment. It replaces earlier light and fire imagery. Uh, Brutus reiterates there's no need to swear an oath, saying every drop of blood that every Roman bears and nobly bears is guilty of a several bastardy if they break the promise to murder Caesar. And he uses the imagery of noble Roman blood to appeal to the conspirator's sense of honour. The repetition of bears emphasises the adjective nobly, highlighting his belief that they are acting for the public good. So blood is therefore used to rationalise spilling more blood, Caesar's blood. Brutus's belief that they will act in the public good can also be seen when he declares, let us be sacrifices, but not butchers, as it would be too bloody to dismember Caesar, but he must bleed. In other words, let's kill him, but not mutilate his body. The sacrifice and blood imagery implies the murder has a religious context, again illustrating that he believes his decision is for the greater good. When prioritising the public good over the men's personal safety, Brutus does not expect that there will be any danger from allowing Antony to live. Consequently, he overrules Cassius, who wants Antony dead. Brutus, like Caesar, does not always listen to the views of others. Naively, he fails to consider that Antony's love for Caesar will lead him to reject Brutus's reasons for the assassination. We see the extent to which private beliefs are compromised by public obligations when we meet Brutus's wife, Portia, who symbolises his domestic life. By refusing to tell her what is troubling him, Brutus either does not want Portia to be involved, or he's troubled by his conscience and still has doubts. Whatever his reasons, he refuses to confide in his wife in favour of his duty to the Republic. There's an interesting intermingling between Brutus's public and private thoughts of blood and honour when he calls Portia his true and honourable wife, as dear as are the ruddy drops that visit my sad heart. With Caesar and Portia, blood is associated with honour, but with Caesar it justifies murder, while with Portia the blood simile emphasises love. 
Well, there are a few more paragraphs of analysis of this scene in the Julius Caesar guide, but I'll leave those to the, the, that, those ideas to those of you who pick up a copy. If you found this video useful, please do subscribe to the channel and give the video a thumbs up.